channel. And Nexus. nobody has any idea what we're doing. <clears throat> no one has any idea what we're doing, <clears throat> including us. <clears throat> I feel like especially us. Yeah, for sure. Welcome to the Pedagogy Hypothesis, episode three. Today, we are talking about differentiated instruction and scaffolding within, within education. We're off to a good start. <laughs> um, my name is Patrick Kelly. I'm a K-8 science teacher, and I run an educational YouTube channel. My name is Kayleen Bryson. I am a graduate pedagogy fellow through the Center for Innovations in Teaching and Learning at the University of California, Santa Cruz. I like how we, <clears> like, we're three episodes in and like you've finally gotten this down. Yeah, I'm like, like, I'm like, hold on, I've got a bunch of acronyms, like, sit back for a second, it's gonna take a while. It, <laughs> it does. Okay, so today we are talking about, again, how we make different forms of uh, students able to get the same concept. Because if you're just joining us, uh, when we talk about pedagogy here, we're talking about how things, like the science of teaching, the science of effective teaching. Specifically, how can we make sure that learners of all ability levels are still getting the same concept? Because that is your job as a teacher, right? Making sure that... If you're, what? I know. Crazy. <laughs> uh, making sure that, like, you know, whoever you have, whether they're, like, they're super pros at it already, or if they just don't get it at all, that they're, they leave your classroom, or your lab understanding the topic. Yeah, totally. Uh, forgot Four Leaf said connecting to the individual. Awesome. Absolutely. Like, that's exactly what we're preaching. And we're going to kind of talk about how to connect to individuals in a population setting, right? Because a classroom yep. is very population and social dense and not very individual dense. And we want to still bring the individuals in and make them feel important, but it's inherently in the classroom climate. Which yeah. are multiple people usually. So. Yeah. And actually, it's funny that somebody in the chat, Women Science, thank you, welcome. Uh, this is not our first live stream. This is actually our th fourth together total, mm -hmm. um, but third within this series that's called the Pedagogy Hypothesis. It's every Sunday at this time. Um, we just talk about stuff that's going on within the science of teaching. Yes, which is a lot. Yeah, so. it is. <laughs> It's funny, one of, the, one of the comments that we got today was like, oh, pedagogy isn't really changing. Um, and pedagogy does sound like kind of an old school statement, right? And it is an old school word. Yeah, it's true. But uh, it is changing, right? How the landscape of education looks is constantly changing. Gosh, like, again, for those of you, I want to hear like when everybody here went to school. Um, specifically, when did you do, like, what did the landscape of school look like when you were in junior high, high school, uh, college? You know, if you're in grad school right now, obviously that's going to look like, that's going to look yeah. different than 10 years ago, 15 years ago. Totally. Um, yeah, so it is, it is constantly changing. There's, there's plenty of stuff to talk about. Yeah, and I hope we can convince you of that over the next 11 episodes, because there's, there's 14 episodes total. Yeah. So. You see what we did there, by the way? PH, Pedagogy Hypothesis, 14 episodes. We're so funny. All right. Um, let's get into the logo. The logo looks like Lima's paper. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't make the logo. Gabe yeah. Did. Awesome. Thanks, Gabe. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Uh, I guess we should t actually start talking about what we're supposed to talk about today then. Okay. So why do we do this? We never even put that in the outline. Like, why do we make things different for different students? Oh. My computer wanted to remind me that I may be doing a PH episode right now. No Thank kidding. Thank you, computer. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So why do we do this? Um, and this, again, is where we want to hear where you have, where your background is too. If you think back to your education, let's, let's talk like primary and junior high here. Um, and we know we have learners from all over the world coming into the live stream, which is fantastic. Um, did your teacher move too fast with the material, just right, or too slow with the material? And of course, for your, for your pace yep. of learning. Yeah. And again, knowing that they have X amount of, of students in the classroom, how were they for you? Like, did it match really well with your teacher? Were you, again, were you too advanced or were you like still struggling a little bit? And the goal with both of these things, I'm gonna be talking about differentiated instruction, Kay Kayleen is gonna be talking about scaffolding, is how we can make that concept um, accessible to all these different students. Which was a big theme last week too, was, was inclusion and accessibility yeah. um, for students. Yeah. Um, favorite subject to teep says, uh, says forgot for Lee Clother. I'm a science teacher. So, junior high science Please, right now. Can they read your shirt? Oh. Mm. I did a science. I'm falling down. I'm falling down. <laughs> okay. Patrick, go to Patrick did a science. Yeah, dftba.com. <laughs> go to it. Um, yeah, I teach junior high science. <laughs> we're so a wreck cool. right now. We're a wreck. <laughs> no, we're great. This is, this, is, this is the best. My favorite class to teach, because I teach upper division, so I teach higher education classes, um, biochemistry and molecular biology lab, actually. I like that. Yeah. Okay, so then as far as like our two concepts, um, I think that people are going to be more familiar with scaffolding uh, if they are in general. Yeah, uh, has anybody heard of scaffolding of knowledge or is this 
like new to everybody. Um, it's a it's a technique that I think people inherently gravitate towards, but they don't understand how to organize it always into a hierarchy, which is what I'm hoping to kind of demystify today is how to how to organize scaffolding of knowledge so that you can yeah like layers exactly so oftentimes when you think of the word scaffold you think of a structure right so a scaffold is something that provides structure and so we're going to take that idea of a scaffold and provide it to knowledge we're going to find a way to structure knowledge so that we can facilitate old knowledge into new knowledge do we get bored of teaching the same curriculum oh good thank you for, okay no. good thank you for the same questions yeah there's i do you want to answer this first yeah because no uh, Patrick. Sorry. <laughs> I hate that. Uh, no, I don't get bored of teaching the same curriculum because my students are constantly evolving and the students are what define a classroom. So, no. Yeah, and I'll, I'll back that up too with just the students will always, will always be changing and your challenge is always going to be increasing as well. Um, plus, just like, you know, how you teach from year to year will always be refining. So the challenge of like that craft uh, yes. is going to change also. Yes. Um, some good questions too. Okay, so yeah. back to, I guess, back to scaffolding here. Yeah, so let's talk about scaffolding. So the main idea of scaffolding of knowledge is to take previous knowledge and add knowledge to it in a guided manner with a structure that is temporary. Mm -hmm. We'll break this down in a little bit. Um, and so the key points for scaffolding of knowledge and education are that it has to have structure, it has to have a common base, and it has to work within your current student's knowledge foundation. And so um, one of the things that I like to remind people about is that a base of knowledge in a classroom is probably not what you actually think it is. So for example, let's say I'm teaching a molecular biology class. It is not actually appropriate for me to assume that everyone knows what a gene is. Why not? So, um, because that is material that you're teaching in that class and students learn at different rates. And so the odds of somebody grasping the idea of a gene on the same level is actually really unfair. Okay. So you take it back to even more basal knowledge than that. So I did an example recently and I've, if you tuned in at some point prior to this, I've used this example, but I'm clarifying it now specifically as scaffolding of knowledge. Ooh, the pizza story? The pizza story. Okay. Yes. Um, I don't know if people have heard the pizza story yet, but it was, it's, it's scaffolding of knowledge. And so the pizza story is, um, I was trying to teach students how to write a scientific paper. They don't know how to write a scientific paper. So the basal knowledge that they have here is pizza because within my classroom, every student has had pizza before and I felt confident in that. So that basal knowledge is something that you have to establish with your students that you know is not exclusive. And I knew that every person in that classroom had had pizza at some point because we talked about food literally all the time in my classroom. College students, yes, are somewhat obsessed with Yeah, yeah and I'm at a college food. university and there's always pizza and stuff. So that's my base knowledge. In a molecular biology class, my base knowledge is pizza. The structure that I'm using is writing a paper. So the, the scaffolding part comes in where I say, we're going to write a paper together. The other part of scaffolding is it does have to be cooperative. So you have to be collaborating on knowledge together or it's not scaffolding because you are the facilitator of knowledge. And in order for the students to get to new knowledge, you have to facilitate that. How, okay. So then my question for you with that concept is like, and I was thinking about this the other day, every time I've asked somebody, all right, this makes sense, right? Or that idea of like, if you just keep on saying like, oh, um, uh, let me know if you have any questions that that is sufficient for like checking to make sure that they get it, which it totally is not. Like that's that's like the least sufficient thing. So, so uh, sorry, go ahead. I was gonna grab a pen, write down questions. Oh, okay. Continue. Okay. Um, I guess like, how are you assessing that they're keeping up with you? Like how often are you checking to make sure that the scaffold, like they're going from this base level of understanding to the next rung so that they're eventually getting up to the very top part? Right, so that, that, that comes into play when I mentioned collaboration. So it's my job to facilitate knowledge and to make sure that everybody's on a similar page. So I'm physically walking around my classroom and asking students how they're doing. I'm interacting with them. I'm helping them to gain new knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, so when you're thinking about how to scaffold something, step one, find a common base. And if you think it's yeah. common, go even below that. Go more common than you're thinking. Um, step two, make sure that you're facilitating that knowledge there. So make sure that you are there to interact with the students and help them learn. Step three in this example is the scaffold of writing a paper. So my students and I wrote a paper together on pizza preferences on college age students in UC Santa Cruz in this classroom. And so the paper title was 
pizza preferences among college age students at the University of California, Santa Cruz. We had, um, we had a method section, we had a results section, and we had a discussion section. And I took in all of their data because they had a little piece of paper when they came into lab sitting on their desk that was empty. And I asked them to write down their favorite pizza preferences among these four choices and then where they're from among these five choices. I think it was Northern California, Southern California, Central California, Bay Area, and then other, because most of my students are from California mm -hmm. within the UC system. Um, and I took all that information while they were doing their beginning part of the class, and I made it into graphs. I made literal graphs and figures from that data about pizza. Not about science, about pizza. So remembering that the basal knowledge here is pizza. I'm trying to scaffold how to write a paper into pizza. And so, as the students went on through class, we brought up this data and we had a results section and a discussion section. And then the, the scaffolding and creating of new knowledge now is that I can remove pizza from that equation, but they now know how to write a paper. Is that what you're talking about when you say like temporary? Temporary structure, exactly. So the students are never gonna write a paper on pizza, most likely, um, but I can take that away and now they have a frame for how to establish new knowledge and that new knowledge is writing a paper. So. Scaffolding works because I'm not asking them to learn multiple things at once. I'm asking them to only learn how to write a paper. They already know how about pizza. So if I were to say, I want you to write a pizza, oh, a pizza. Write a pizza, please. <laughs> write a pizza, please. I want you to write a paper on how to ligate this gene into this vector and how you test for it. They are actively learning how to ligate genes. They're actively learning how to do molecular biology. So to ask them to learn this new thing and also how to write a paper is learning two new things at once. Scaffolding takes everything that's new away except for one thing. And you put it in a temporary structure so that when you remove that structure, you still have new knowledge. Do you find that when you do that, their enthusiasm for that subject also increases? Because I'm thinking like, yes. if I'm learning something, if I feel like I'm understanding it, I'm gonna, that's gonna have like a twofold effect where one, I'm gonna understand it more. So your job as a teacher is being done, but also like, of course, you like to get things right. So as right. a learner, I would be way more invested in a teacher or professor that makes sure that they're kind of coming down to my level, making right. sure that I understand it like incrementi incrementally. In I, you in know what I'm trying to increments? say. You know what I'm trying to say. Incrementally. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, that's yeah. the word. Um, and then, then they're just so much more excited about the subject. Yeah, and they're excited about the subject too because from a confidence perspective, I'm not asking them to show that they might not know something within the classroom. Mm -hmm. I'm literally asking your opinion on pizza. You know, you can't be wrong. Your opinion on pizza is totally valid, you know? And so, so it establishes a sense of not only confidence, but it also, we talk a lot about social networks on pH and how social networks can actually facilitate knowledge because it, it brings emotion into that setting and emotions kind of help hammer situations and time into mm -hmm. your brain. Um, and so you're creating a social network, which establishes neuronal networks. You're removing any issues with confidence and you're only asking them to learn one new thing within a structure that you can take away and those students still have permanently. Okay, so then knowing that, if I'm following along, you've established their knowledge, you've given them a good jumping off point. At what point do you kind of like let go of the reins and let them take over entirely? That's when they write their paper. So mm -hmm. for me, uh, the, my, my students had to write a paper. And so for me, it's... Don't, don't oh, sorry, sorry, I forgot. Right, right. Yeah. So for me, uh, asking them to physically write a paper is the structure that I was using. And they have that structure now and they can go and run with that and actually physically write their paper. So that's the outcome. It's giving them a toolkit to allow them to know how to do the new thing. And I just gave them the structure to get there. And that's why, so I wrote it on the board with them. We physically wrote my paper, our paper on pizza together on mm -hmm. the board. As soon as I erase that, that's my scaffold. And we can talk about different things that scaffolds can be. Scaffolds can also be um, empty rubrics. So one thing that I see that teachers do a lot of times that I don't always approve of or think is the most efficient way to do certain teaching pedagogical practices is handing out rubrics with a bunch of information. There's a time and a place for that for sure because they can be very efficient and they can be used as tools that students have in their back pocket. But if you actually leave parts of that rubric empty and ask your students to fill it out with you, you're being collaborative, you're working with your students, that's scaffolding. That piece of paper that has missing information is a structure because they have to fill it in. And when you leave, they now have new knowledge. So a scaffold okay. is anything that provides a structure for them to learn something on their own that you have to collaborate with that is based in fundamental knowledge that everybody has. And that basal knowledge is probably even lower than you think. Okay, so like talking about that basal knowledge then, 
say it's the first day of class, like some, it's crazy to me, like, or it is, it is far-fetched to me that some people haven't started school yet. You know, like it's September. I, yeah, that's not fair. I've been in school for a <laughs> month. Um, but, uh, okay, you, oh, must, like you still have the chance to like do that first day of basal knowledge gathering. Correct. What are some ways, like, because we do practical things on the show, like how can somebody actually get that basal knowledge? It's, I feel like the pizza assumption is fair. Yes, it is. It is very fair. So uh, if you haven't watched PH episode two, I actually, I'm not just like self-promoting here. I actually really suggest you watch it because it's super helpful. Um, mm -hmm. But you take those practices of inclusivity and how to make your classroom inclusive and you kind of get a, a feel for your classroom climate. And once you know your students well enough, then you can start implementing things like this. Because the last thing you want to do is project something onto your students where you say, I assume that all of you know X, Y, and Z right off the bat on day one. That is a terrible idea because you don't actually know your students yet. And so you're projecting something onto them that you think they should know. Nope, 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 <laughs> nope. So I would wait until say week three or week four when you kind of know your student population more, you've talked to them a little bit, um, you sort of know their background a little bit more to start implementing things like this. Awesome. Um, let's get uh, women's sciences question. I feel like that's a really good one. Okay. The school system should focus uh, on more on experience more than just information. Um, and I think I see where you're going here. Um, yeah, absolutely. Are mm -hmm. you and just to clarify? Are you talking about experiences, like with experiences with science or experimentation? Um, because I feel like both of those could be interpreted a little bit differently. Yeah. Um, so I would I would love to hear a follow up on that. Yeah. I mean, maybe experience can be so many different things, right? Experience can be active learning experience can be internships experience can be those social outreach. networks you're talking about yeah social networks outreach and i think that's one of the things that patrick and i are really trying to like we're trying to preach a couple of things here mm -hmm. um but one of them is the fact that students need to be an active participant in their learning and so we talked in ph episode one about student-centric versus teacher-centric classrooms and if you make your classroom student-centric it's going to inherently be more experience centric as well for the student because you're you're asking them to be an active participant in their learning. Cool. And then Teresa's commenting, uh, maybe she meant to say case studies. And I think all of, I mean, whether it yeah. is experiments or whether it is case study or something that I like to use a lot is because I'm also a language arts teacher. Uh, yeah, perfect. Okay. Learning perfect. by doing and playing. Fantastic. Okay. So I'll say my thing and then I'll say your thing for sure. Um, is the story behind science. Last time we were talking about how conflict can help tell the story of why science has done what it's done. One discovery led to a bunch of new problems that now we need to figure out. And so the narrative, like the actual story of knowledge acquisition is itself interesting. And I think that for some people, those experiences, like hearing the real time, like, oh, the, the interesting story about it gets them so much more interested. And this, then there's some technical know-how to like, to get to the next step. But if that's what stokes your curiosity, then heck yeah, like then that's, yeah. then that's a good thing. Yeah. Teresa also made a comment previously asking, how do you know that students aren't getting bored? Because you do have students in your classroom who may be performing at a higher level earlier on and you have students maybe performing at a, a level that where it takes them a little bit longer to learn new things. And I think that's kind of where making a social environment is critical to ensuring that no student has a different pace of learning. And what I mean by that is when students are interacting in a social environment, you are making a scenario where their education isn't based just on learning information or mm -hmm. taking information in. Their education is also based on how to communicate that information. And so that kind of inherently places students on a more even playing field because if students are having a hard time understanding something, they physically have someone there to talk to about it. Um, and when you remove the necessity of memorizing information and you replace it with basal knowledge, you also take that pressure off. And so I argue that social environments and scaffolding of knowledge actually make it so students who are at different levels of learning don't get as bored or don't get as left behind as a consequence. Yeah. And, and neither of us are psychologists. Oh but yeah, no, definitely yeah, not. Like, no. no, no, I got a C in psych in college. Yeah, my knowledge of the brain is uh, I got one. pink. I, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's about yeah. it. That being said, if you want to yeah. go, a really good neuroscience YouTube channel is called Neurotransmission. I want to plug them. They're good people. Yeah. Um, but uh, I got as one. far as like, I we've got, got one. one, I hope, more than just a nice hat rack. Um, oh, you're learning that for me. Oh. I am. See, I, I, um, I've texted you, I think, every day for the last like month and a half. Yeah, you have. Ah, poor me. <laughs> um, saludos. I'm great. Come on. 
Either way, when you give a base, <laughs> like when you give a base knowledge, you're at least you have something to hook back to. I'm sure there's a concept yes. within psychology that uses this. I, we probably, don't know what it's called. That's why I mentioned brains in the first place. <laughs> um, but the point is, like, at least you're coming back to you have a home base. Like you have a comfortable bit of knowledge where, and again. As a K-8 teacher, I see this all the time, where you're just, a student is confused, they don't get it, and they're just like, nope, I quit. Like, I'm done with this. Peace. And, and hooking them back onto like, no, you can do this. Remember, you likened this uh, to how, like, your favorite, I don't know, whatever, your favorite skateboard is, like, slower because of this reason or something. I don't, that's an example I have never used before. Um, but... Thanks. <laughs> uh, but at least, like, then you have a home base to go back to. Like, you have something that, something that within your relationship with them is a, is a safe thing. Uh, can we ask Patrick's Ooh. kids if they, if his, if students enjoy his classes? Uh, if they were here, yeah, every now yeah. and then some alumni will pop into the chat. Oh, that's actually true. Yeah. Yeah. We have had your students watch our show. Yeah, I obviously won't name them for reasons. Um, but remember that, like, I teach junior high kids, and the minimum age for Instagram is, I think, 13 or 14. Oh, really? So to have, yeah. Okay. yeah. So to have my kids, my, my current students actually get into the chat would be a big no-no. Um, I mean, granted, they're, they're children, so, like, it's, some of them are going to have accounts anyway. It's a layer cake of no. A layered cake of no. A layered cake of no. So many okay. levels of no. I like that. No. So, um, Women's Science asked, how can I learn to communicate my learnings and thoughts? And I guess with this, I want to ask you, are you asking the question, how can I communicate when I have learned things as an instructor? Or how do I communicate Ooh. when my students, I think, have learned things? Because those are two different ways of communicating, having knowledge. Or are you talking, at, at, like, from a student perspective, where, like, you have a good example that you want to bring up to the to the professor or something um, that's a relevant example so you think you know so someone also just asked would you say biomedical science is a good degree <laughs> uh yeah i also am in the program for biomedical sciences and engineering so i'm a little biased but yeah totally uh your oh, own uh, knowledge fantastic okay um that's a really good question because now that is we're, we're talking about it because we have such a, an emphasis on student-centric learning um, from our perspective of being instructors. But we were both students at one point. Yes. And so we have had to try to communicate our thoughts to that person. So, like, I'll give my example. Um, so my undergrad is in kinesiology, which is basically just physics plus anatomy combined. Um, they, that gets you into physical therapy and a bunch of other things. But my interests are in action sports, like skateboarding, surfing, and, and bike riding, like very dangerous accident-prone sports. Um, and so, like, those two subjects went hand in hand. I was, I ended up looking well, that's into... that's funny, yeah. Yeah, for real. Um, <laughs> I ended up looking at, like, case studies of, of bikers who had hurt themselves doing something, gotten in an accident, and then related their, in, their mechanism of injury into what we were learning. And so it was... The professor was excited that at least I had come up with an example that was like that showed that I was thinking about the material outside of their class. So, women's science, when you have your thought that either you're trying to relate to others or to your professor, I think if you can show like that you're trying to bridge the gap with an example from from your life with what they're interested in or with what they're teaching you, I think that's going to only be picked up on positively and then the conversation can go from there and you'll and then you'll the, then they'll want to learn more and you'll get to explain yourself further. I might also elaborate that on and say, don't be afraid to use alternative techniques of communication. Of so in the last episode, we also talked about how when you're doing something that's audio, you need written or you're doing things that are written, you need audio or maybe visual or anything like that. So even earlier, like an hour ago, I was explaining epigenetics to Patrick and I wasn't Englishing very well. Like I, I couldn't explain to him in the words that I wanted to use because it, again, I think my brain is also kind of like a, ping pong ball sometimes um but i just at least it's a pink ping pong ball yeah, exactly. we know this yes oh my gosh yeah so um so i got, got out a notebook and i just started drawing what i was trying to explain to patrick and, and that was so much more effective too and like, it was more effective so don't be afraid to in your classrooms or in just day-to-day -day communication don't be afraid to bring in other forms of communication that can help you make your point or help you communicate what you're trying to say that you have knowledge in mm -hmm. Truth's question, would you say that being a teacher is the higher expression of psychom because you have to tell hardcore science with easy words? Um, do you want to go first? I don't know about higher expression of yeah, psychom. I don't think it's a higher expression either. I think teaching is a very specific scenario where you have to 
throw your pride out the window and you have to remember that your job is to help them gain knowledge mm -hmm. and not to show that you have knowledge. And so I don't, it, it is science communication, but more than that, it's science education facilitation. And I think that's where the big difference is because like, on, and I've had this, I haven't told you this yet, but I have, I've been having like a big struggle lately of like, am I a science teacher or am I a science communicator or can I be both? Or is this like, an, is there an inherent gray line between the two? And to me, like the difference that I'm kind of arriving at is that a science communicator is communication. Um, but a science teacher, it, like it's still your job. Like your job is get student from A to B or at least push them Correct. from A to B in, in some meaningful way. And so that involves sometimes more than communication. It does, a, it, like, again, your favorite science YouTuber doesn't give you a test at the end of the video to check your knowledge. They put it out there, they communicate, and maybe they'll have a conversation with you in the comments or like try to get a, an evening going where they have a talk or something. Yes. But as a teacher, you need to push them towards that base level of knowledge, that, or at least again, from A to B. You're gonna have to do your, do your camera thing, by the way, here pretty soon. Thank you very much. You're I, yeah, I'm looking at the counter. Also, I might wanna add to that as well, that as a teacher, and I, I've heard this from somebody, I can't remember who, so I'm not taking credit for it, but I think it's genius. 90% of your, 80, 90% of your work, more or less, should be done outside of the classroom. Hmm. And so if you're trying to make a student-centric classroom where there are active participants in their learning, the more of your work that you can do outside of the classroom, the better, because that means when students are actually in the classrooms, they're the ones facilitating the knowledge, they're the ones helping to engage through social interactions. And so I think... There's a lot of overlap in that Venn diagram of yeah, science sure. communicator and science teacher, but a communicator is trying to explain things to you and a teacher is trying to facilitate knowledge for you. That's just my opinion though. Yeah, and and I'm thinking like a science communicator is great, but like if you want to get hands-on experience, they're not the person for you. Right. I don't know I don't know if you agree with that. I, can you reword it? Sure, like, okay, if I'm gonna try to, if I'm going to try to do an experiment, if I'm like a, a 13 year old, and I want to do a science experiment because I am hungry for knowledge. I don't want to see a science communicator. I want to go do it myself. And sometimes that's going to mean that a science teacher, instructor, or even just like somebody in an extracurricular organization is, is helping you do your own experimentation. Okay. Sorry, I was writing down. No, it's okay. I don't, I don't know if that is. So, so I, teaching is giving the knowledge and SciComm is encouraging people into science. I don't, I don't know if I agree with that either because like, Sorry, I've been talking for too long. Before. Yeah, no, I think, I mean, Teresa's bringing up a really good point here, and I do want to um, quickly say to women in science, good, awesome. I'm, I'm glad that helping to communicate things through pictures is going to be helpful yes. for you. I hope that is really, like, At, actually beneficial let, to you. Let's continue the conversation, because I feel like there's a lot to talk about there, too. Yes, so, and we will get to differentiate instruction at some point. I guess. Yeah. So, teaching is giving the knowledge, SciComm is encouraging people into science. I think there is a little bit of, I think there is validity in that, Okay. you know, um, I think she brings up a good point. Teaching is, I, I, I still love the word facilitating and I know Teresa is Italian, so there is mm -hmm. sometimes like a language barrier thing there, but, um, um, I think SciComm is encouraging people's just innate curiosities, I hope. And I hope that the goal of SciComm is to bring science to society in a way where we can mesh science more into socio-cultural economics, essentially, and where we can like bring, okay. where science can be like part of society. Cause right now I feel like you have like the classic example of like scientists are evil or scientists are the best, right? Like, no, we're just scientists, you know? And I think the role of SciComm is to, is to integrate scientists more into society as a whole. Yeah. And that's just my opinion. Yeah. What's your opinion? Uh, I think I gotta get the camera actually right now. Oh, you on like the, the last bit. You do have to get the camera. Right. Uh, so Matt asked the question of how frequently I can drop the phone. Um, Matt asked the question of what do we think the role of extracurricular activities is with regard towards student study? So what value do you think extracurriculars have on student knowledge and student studies? Which I think is a good question for you because recess. You get, hey, guess what? Our audio completely stopped recording. So we're basing off that. Sweet. Thanks, Audition. Um, that being Yay, said, Adobe, no get at me. I would love to get your money somehow. Um, okay. Uh, recess extracurriculars. Sorry, I was completely not listening. So, uh, someone... <laughs> sorry, I'm sorry. Let's be real here. Someone asked the question, um, 
how do you think extracurricular activities play a role in student education, student fulfillment of knowledge within their area of study? Oh, dude, there we go. Okay, so thank you for rephrasing it. Sorry, I'm like You're welcome. zoning. Am I looking at this camera now, Patrick? Yeah, I guess okay. so. I mean, we'll still have this on Nexus, so we'll be good. Um, okay, so does, does it go into like enhancing their education? Yes, totally. One, they're getting it from a different angle. So just like how there are different types of learners out there, visual, auditory, all that, like, and com like gray area combinations of everything, getting it involved, like getting science involved in some other aspect of that student's life is only going to be a positive thing unless they burn out with it. But again, if they're tying it to something they actually enjoy, I don't see that happening. Right. Um, yeah. All right, cool. Yeah. Differentiated instruction. All right, let's talk about this thing. All right, All right, so we just talked about scaffolding. So going from like a basal level of knowledge and facilitating their knowledge to a, a higher degree and then removing the scaffolding um, so that they, they now have this higher, this higher message. Yes. Um, differentiated instruction is a little bit different. And this is, it was alluded to earlier, but thinking back to your own education, the instructor probably moved either too fast, just right, or too slow for your, uh, for your ability. Okay, um, and so differentiated instruction is meeting that student where they are. So as a teacher, this means a few things. It means that you're gonna have to figure out what the ability level of your students are, and then how do you best meet them? And then somehow, again, as a, coming from like the junior high perspective, somehow giving a grade based on all of that, knowing that you have basically like, again, however many times like you're gonna- It's like the hardest part of your job, dude. On, Cause parents get involved too. Um, right. Yeah. Um, Good, and, and Tori Explorers, thank you for backing that up. Appreciate it. Um, hey, Christian. Hello, hello. Um, okay, so the differentiated instruction usually looks like this. There's some kind of knowledge assessment at the beginning of, again, we're at the, at the start of the trimester, so we gave our standardized test. It's not a standardized test as far as like getting students into college or whatever, like the SAT or ACT in America. Um, this is, using some kind of adaptive learning test. For my school, we use something called the STAR test. No idea what the acronym is actually for, but it'll give you an idea of what skills the student needs to work on, which is the most helpful thing in the entire world. So instead, of, like I, I absolutely swear, like I use this in my lesson planning like as a, as a Bible. Um, so it's not saying like, oh, you are the best student in the class and then you are the worst student in the class. It helps us group our student. And this is where the differentiated part comes in. It uses the, the skills that each student has or doesn't have to make the most effective use of time and structure in the classroom. So saying like in a, in a we'll use my language arts class, for example, I teach seventh grade language arts. So ta taking like this, this part of the class, like this third of the class really needs to work on sentence structure. This one really needs to work on plot arc and this one really needs to work on basic punctuation. We're not saying that like one group is smart, middle and dumb. We're saying that like, now we get to fine tune. Yeah, we get to fine tune it. Exactly. So like making sure that you're not teaching something that one student is going to be bored with. I know I've been going like this for the entire episode, but making sure that I also got an empty piece of paper if you wanted to draw anything. Thank you. I appreciate you're it. You're welcome. Um, but yeah, just making sure that you're not boring the student. You're actually challenging them the entire time. I've found that. And again, tell me if like this is at all relatable that like you're not usually bored. Like learning is fun. Learn it like getting to learn something that you're that pushes your skill or ability is a fun thing to do, whether it totally. is in yeah, whether it's like in writing and reading or whether it's in science. Like, we like doing that stuff, and so all you need to do is hook a student's attention. And usually they'll do that if they're actually being challenged. And again, if they're just if they're just bored because they know everything, because they're that voracious of a reader, then you gotta you gotta step your game up as a teacher. So coming at, so audience, like, tell me what's up. Like, were you that kid and just get a feel of the audience? Were you that, were you that kind of student where just the teacher moved way too fast for you? Were you that student who like, they were moving so slow and you just had your like little comic book under your desk or like whatever you had to, to pass the time? Or do you feel like the school actually moved at the right pace for you? Oh, and nine. There's a dog. There's a dog. Yeah, this is fresh press, fresh press pedagogy now. Yeah. Although we do not have the dog like right here climbing around and like... <laughs> Yeah. Oh, that being said, Susanna did ask a question. We'll get to that later. Okay, yeah, that's right. Oh, yeah, this is fun. We actually had like good audience participation today, which is dumb. I used to be a science teacher. Mm -hmm. uh, is the STAR Our test system. largely specific to arts-based subjects? In science, math, we yep. used to do assessment, homework, reports, quizzes all the time. 
Yeah. Which um, gave us an indication of the students. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Christian. Um, yeah. So this is the star test itself is used for language arts and, and mathematics. Um, they're working on one within science. Um, the big deal with that is that math is, at least I imagine, I know there's complexities within math, but I imagine it is very linear. There's also complex numbers. Oh, that being said, Pedagogy <laughs> Hypothesis is looking for a new co-host. Uh, email uh. patrickpelly at gmail.com. Um, <laughs> all right, so, yeah. It's we mainly... also have to find a new location, though, home slides. Yeah, we're at I house, guess. So. Um, okay, so, yeah, it's mainly for language arts and math because at least that follows, like, a linear progression of, like, you do need these skills in order to get onto this skill. For some people, like, again, they're gonna, they're going to pick up on things within life sciences, maybe a little bit better than earth sciences, maybe a little bit better than physical sciences. Like, physics involves a lot of math, um, life sciences not as much, although I know you're a life scientist, so, like, well, I, I mean, yeah, I you're am. full of I'm a physical scientist, technically. I mean, I guess, and I guess, we'll, like, chemists will always... I'm a It'll physical scientist who knows too. nothing about physics. Sure. Um, so yeah, like within sciences, there there doesn't exist a test yet. I think because it you can't make that linear progression. Um, the reason I, I keep on coming back to linear is because these star tests or the, the adaptive learning test will start every student off with the base level question saying a typical seventh grader is going to know this. If they get it right, they get an increased difficulty question. If they get it wrong, you kind of make it a little bit easier. And that progress follows until you finally fine tune where that, where that child is at. And then you have an idea of, of two things. Technically their percentile ranking, which is of all the seventh graders in the world, you rank number blah, blah, blah. That isn't super useful information. What is useful is saying that this student has these skills proficient, but they could use a little bit of extra help with this. And that's where we get to differentiate that student into a different group and then present the material to them. Correct. Does, yeah. Correct. Okay, cool. <laughs> yeah. Does it, does the STAR program differentiate based on the ways that students learn? Or is it the things that they know? No, so um, this does go off of just this snapshot in time. Oh, you're speaking too fast. I know. Place. Sorry. The, sorry. I apologize. Thank you for it's calling the, us on thank our you. crap. Appreciate it. Um, I just get so excited. Just get so excited. But yeah, okay. I'll chill. I'll chill. Um, so it is just a snapshot in time. So it is just saying at this month or whenever, because we typically go on a month to month basis, um, this is what they're proficient in. Like this is what skill they need to work on or what they've mastered, which is good because it will give us growth as well. It will say that, hey, yes, congrats. They were, they started off here. They improved this weakness. Good job. Um, so it, it, it does not account for style of learning. No, it is just their proficiency with that test. Okay. That being said, I'm, I hope that there are other tests that are being developed there um, because, again, one, competition to make the best test possible that accounts for all types of learners. Um, but also, yeah, I want to see how different technology works with this. Yeah, someone asked the question, is science capital a thing that we consider in the States? And I don't even know what that means. Science capital? Yeah, no, that was an actual, yes, yeah, science capital. Something you guys consider in the classroom in the United States. Interesting. Um, by th I interpret that to mean like a base level of science knowledge. What do you think? I don't know. Okay. Can you elaborate? <laughs> yeah, please. Wait. You stumped us. We so apparently not. Apparently we don't consider it in the United States because we don't even know what it is. Yeah. Maybe that was first grade and we've already, we've already forgotten it. Maybe. Um, okay. So. All right. Differentiated all right. instruction. Differentiated instruction. So. We've got that STAR test um, or whatever form of assessment you're going to use just to get an idea of where the students are at. And again, these are electronic tests, so you don't have to grade them or use your interpretation because again, human brains are weird. And as a teacher, you're still going to be biased to, uh, well, the student seems smart. The student has a good track record. Maybe they had an off day where the computer test will give you hard data and it is not biased. So we have that advantage. Yeah. Once you have that data, then you're able to take your planning stage. And for that'll, that will look different based on what class you teach. You know, math versus language arts is obviously gonna be a big deal. Um, and then what kind of resources you have available to you. So my typical class for, for language arts, again, just because this, this is the clear place where I get to use that, uh, that, that tiered learning test to guide my instruction. Um, it'll allow me to split my groups up into three groups. Again, because I have classes of about 24 to 30, um, that is, that's a manageable group size, anywhere from like eight to 10 students per group. 
And so what I can do with that is say, maybe not everybody is working on this exact skill, but I'm gonna group those students by what they can all work on together. One, to make the most efficient use of our time together, but also so that they can bounce around ideas from themselves. And that way, again, you're not getting the whole social hierarchy of like, oh, this student gets everything, and so whatever the 13 year olds deal with. Um, and then from there, I, I do what's called uh, stations. This is something that like first through third grade teachers are using all the time. I mean, again, we can bookend that too with like K through four. Um, but the younger elementary grades are using these stations so that they can get a lot of different things done within a class period um, and then teach to a smaller group and then have the other kids work on that in real time. Like it's just so much more fast, like so much faster. You can give a worksheet to one group, have them practice. You can do direct instruction to another group and then have them apply that in front of you and get like real time feedback. You can have another group doing some kind of like some kind of uh, uh, language arts or math app, which is something that that my class uses. We're doing Lexia right now, which has just a huge library of readings that those students can do, um, and then something with uh, math programs as well. Like that's something. Alex is a good one. Uh, I think we're gonna answer some questions. Maybe yes. A little, yes. A little tap. Oh, oh yeah, I'm writing this question, and that's a really good question. Um... Mm -hmm. So essentially, oh, oh my gosh, what's your handle? Uh, uh, Slafarve? S T oh S T L E. Yeah, you can let, let us know what your actual name is. So we can call you by name. I'm looking at that as like St. Louis a fever, uh, like yeah. S T L a fever. <laughs> I got a fever. Okay. You should get that essentially, checked out. Essentially, <laughs> really, really go to a doctor. <laughs> um. So this handle that I can't pronounce, sure. asked the question saying, there was a study done by the Mathematics Association and Alliance regarding calculus as a, a bottleneck oftentimes. Mm -hmm. And he he or she or they commented that um, oftentimes you need a specific skill set to create knowledge. And yeah. I completely agree. And this is something that we see oftentimes at the university level because you'll have a series within a Courses within a series, right? So Chem 1A, Chem 1B, Chem 1C, for example. Lefevre. Okay, thank yeah, you. Yeah, thank you. So it's it's assumed that if you are in Chem 1B, you have the knowledge from Chem 1A. But oftentimes there are certain fields of study that are just inherently difficult for a lot of people to grasp, and I think calculus is one of them. And so that's where it would be your job as a teacher to provide external sources for students to... Um, to build up that knowledge base if they need to, because it's not, unfortunately, if you're teaching a class that is above calculus, your goal is to teach that class that is above calculus. And you need to assume that your students do have a knowledge base of calculus. If you find that they don't, and this is where I, again, I, I say this almost every episode, I feel like, but this is where I preach pre-class quizzes, where you can ask students questions like that. Like, if you know that calculus is, a, is something that can create a bottleneck within your classroom, pull your students on how comfortable mm -hmm. they are with calculus. And if you see that a lot of your students are not comfortable with calculus, create an environment or create situations where students can have access to relearning calculus. I'm thinking, I've, I've taken physics twice now. The first time I failed, which is why I had to take it again. Um, but when I did fail, uh, that, that professor like started, I mean, right away with stuff that I did not understand. And it was the same prereqs every time. But again, this was also me trying to get like, some some classes done ahead of time like being a little too ambitious but like one teacher started way fast ended at the same place that the other class did the other one kind of dipped down and did a really good job scaffolding still ended at the same place um and so i think there are really good ways to do that where you can dip back into the into the knowledge that uh that your students have and just you know you're still going sorry i was talking to my dog yeah my dog's been like a grumpy old man he does this thing where he's just like Oh, in his crate, and he's doing that right now. Daily. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I'm. Um, I just lost. I think uh, Christian. So Christian asked, "Can department heads or admins see students' results from the STAR program?" Mm -hmm. Um, and what he elaborated off of after that was, "Can we see what teachers are being effective in using this program?" Yeah. So, um, the the actual like, if you're interested in the data perspective. Um, that's going to be just within the school. So like of all the, of all the schools within, thank you, of all the school, are you doing that to me? No, I was telling Owen to plots. Okay. Cause I'm trying to like be, be like slower and be yeah. aware of that. Um, uh, okay. So yes, within our school, we can see the data from, um, from our students, but even me, I can only see the ones that I teach. So for me, just junior high, I have no business looking at like what the fifth graders or fourth graders are doing. Um, and then within our district, we don't share that 
we don't share that information about specific students. We might get our, our benchmark, so like how we're doing as a school, but that's really more for just like seeing what programs are effective, but that's not gonna be at the student to student level. That's just, again, that is a good, that is a good way of measuring though. So yeah, to, I think that Christian, it seems like you're interested in, is this, is this an effective measure? Like, is this a good way of at least having some, stand, some data to say that what we're doing in the classroom is effective? Uh, oh no, the teacher being fired? because uh, it didn't, didn't, didn't develop a skill set. Um, cool. Uh, on the upside, you could use your effectiveness for promotions. Yeah, totally got it. Um, oh, thank you, battery. Was I, I, were, was we I have, right? We still have 15 minutes. We're going to be fine. Um, well, we'll see. Either way, have a lovely day. Bye. <laughs> Follow us. Um, no, so like, again, this, I don't know how it is. You're in Australia, I think, right, Christian? Um, and s I don't think it's going to be that way in... In Australia, it isn't that way in America either. Um, it takes a lot. Like we're impacted for teachers right now, and this is getting past pedagogy and getting more into like the the cultural and political things going on in our countries right now. Um, but you're probably not going to fire a teacher because their star test scores weren't good. Um, there, there are other like there are bigger problems out there. And that's only one measure of, of effectiveness also. Yeah. It's a, and it's, it's and new. We'll talk about assessment later in PH because assessment is very complicated. Yeah. Um, but still, like, again, this is something that is on a computer, so it is kind of a privileged thing to have. It's a good, it's a good way of measuring skill sets, and I'm very glad that my school has it because um, it is a paid service that you do need to buy a subscription to per student. So bigger You just school. set up a perfect segue for the question and answer session. I totally meant to do that. Yeah. So Teresa asked the question. We're segueing into the Q&A session of this. Mm. So we put up a little question box on the side community page and on my page and on Patrick's page asking for you guys to ask questions regarding scaffolding of knowledge or differentiated instruction. And one of the questions from Teresa was, how could AI play a role in education? Yeah. Um, and I'm glad, I'm glad you asked this question, Teresa, because, uh, there are two, not two, I'm sure like the, the uses are going to be infinite in the future. Um, but the way that, that we're using it here for this, this testing is being very reactionary. So like, again, it's not just one piece of paper that all students are getting. Um, and if you're our age, you know, you didn't grow up necessarily with laptops in your classroom. I remember like we had a computer lab that we'd go practice typing on. I played Oregon Trail on my... Ha shout out to Oregon Trail. <laughs> I'm glad that there's finally a game for that on phones. Like that would. And I got a gaming yeah. reference. You did pop culture finally. Good. That's another theme of pedagogy <laughs> hypothesis that Kayleen does not know pop culture. Uh, Send her your favorite memes. Um, yeah. yeah. So like that technology is used so that we can say where that student is, and then in the instructional aspect, the the tools that were like the apps that we use later are going to continue like every day, like every answer that they put. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Dan. Um, I did a pop culture. I did a pop culture. I did a science. Um, so that everything that they're getting right or wrong is being adapted to. That's something that no matter how good of a teacher you are, you're still going to be slower than the machine. Um, so I don't want to talk necessarily about computers taking my job yet. It'll happen someday. Like I'd be foolish to think that they're not, there's not going to be a greater... I know the look of horror that is like that comes to teachers' faces. Um, if you want, like, I also kind of think that you're not you're not wrong, but but I need to start like looking at retirement. Um, if you're really interested in this, I've recommended this video a bunch of times. It's a it's a six year old video at this point. It's called Digital Aristotle by C G P Gray. Um, I know that I've sorry my body's doing weird things right now. No, Owen is like making all the noises. Okay. Um, get, um, okay. More from. All right, so another question from Tree says, how are you ensuring that pedagogy is progressive? I'm gonna let my dog out, hold on. Okay, I'll monologue for a moment. Okay. Okay, um, we're ensuring that pedagogy is progressive, and I know th that, Teresa, your question was phrased a little bit differently, um, but how we make sure that pedagogy is keeping up with the times is by caring about it. And I know that's kind of a weird, it's a, it's a weird <laughs> statement, but some teachers don't care at all about pedagogy. I'm going to be completely honest. Like a lot of, a lot of old school teachers will never care about what the new cool technique is or how they should bring in uh, differentiated teaching into their, into their classrooms. Um, so as long as you care about it, like if you're following this show, you probably care a little bit about like best practices within education. Like this is the purpose of this show. Um, you care about this. I do. It turns out. Yeah. As it turns out. Yeah. Why, wait, why do you care about this? And, like, I care about pedagogy because I love to learn and I am innately incredibly curious. I am honestly a 
permanent five-year-old. And so I, <laughs> I want to ensure that people can learn new things and that everybody can learn new things. And it is, pedagogy is at the cornerstone of creating new knowledge. And so I want to ensure that everybody has the best practice to gain new knowledge, essentially, because curiosity is great. And that's, that's yeah. why I'm a scientist, dude. I remember being, I was like seven or eight years old. And I remember distinctly looking at the grass one day and being like, I wonder how the grass grows. And here I am. Yeah, and here you are. Will you plot, please? Plot. Plot. Yes. Um, I think also just, <laughs> you owe it to yourself. If you want to be good at your job, you keep up on what's new in your field. Yeah. <laughs> so, like, there's, again, and your job happens to be, like, a kind of emotional job, too. Making sure that your students are keeping up with with their base level of knowledge. Like I work with children um, that are just absorbing knowledge all the time and forming into into humans. Like, and I also argue too that pedagogy is applicable to most scenarios of mentorship and leadership. Oh, absolutely, yeah. So, 100%. Any, any of the things that you're learning on pedagogy hypothesis can be applied to any job where you feel like you're in a position of leadership or mentorship. For sure. So, which is actually a good segue to Susanna's question. Mm -hmm. So she said, how can scaffolding and research with new undergrads um, be applicable? It's all you. Fantastic question. So I do, thank you, Susanna. So I do mentor a lot of undergraduates in my lab. That's part of being a graduate student. Um, and you have to remember that they're coming into a lab with zero experience. And so anytime I'm teaching them something new, I am always scaffolding because I'm always taking it down to basal knowledge. I'm never introducing new knowledge while trying to introduce a new technique. I oftentimes will draw pictures, like I'm sure a lot of my students and people who I've mentored before have had tons of pieces of paper with drawings on them, and they keep them because they're really helpful. Um, I, I hand out rubrics to them that have empty spots where they can fill in their formulas, because honestly, in a biochemistry lab, you're mixing a lot of clear liquids and you're doing a lot of algebra. Mm -hmm. So I will have sheets of paper that have blank marks on them that we can fill in together for how much of this to add. And so you can scaffold knowledge with new undergrads by bringing it back down to basal knowledge, by drawing things out visually for them, and by using rubrics instead of just telling them what to do. It takes more effort on your, on your part on the front end, but if they get that knowledge and they integrate it more and they understand something more fundamentally, they're going to come to you less frequently with questions because they have a stronger understanding of the knowledge in the first place. Do you do you view yourself, if you're mentoring a, an undergrad? Sorry, my dog. 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 Yeah, dog. Uh, do you view your role, like, as a mentor to also be, like, part teacher? Like... 110%. Okay. So, like, I'm thinking the, some of the greatest teachers that I've had were the ones that helped me out with an internship. Um, so again, having gone to school for kinesiology, um, those were the ones that I worked at, like, their physical therapy clinic. And they made sure, they would ask every day, what are you learning in class? And then we'd find examples in the clinic. Um, and I'm thinking like that could be a direct relationship to like what they're learning in lab too, mm -hmm. or if they're helping you out with your research. Completely. Another question we had was, what does Kayleen do? <laughs> or I think it was in my laboratory technician. Yes. <laughs> um, I do a lot of things. Turns out I am, I am moderately good at a lot of things. Um, but my <laughs> the job that pays most of my bills is I'm a PhD student at a biochemistry lab. So... Um, I've been a biochemist, a protein biophysicist for about a decade, and that's what I do to pay most of my bills. And then I'm also an enologist and I'm a winemaker. And then I also have this fellowship for teaching and learning. A decade is a long time. I know. Isn't that crazy? Since you were, yeah. I don't want to give away your age, but it's a while. It's been, it's been a hot second. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how do you implement, so note it down, ask the question, how do you implement different, differentiated instruction with different levels in a classroom? Mm -hmm. How do you snuggle with puppies? Mm -hmm. um, how do you actually do it in the classroom? I told the story a little bit ago, like how we actually do it. This is fresh pressed pedagogy at this point. Yeah. Um, okay, so how we actually do it in the classroom uh, is getting those different groups, this idea of doing stations. So, oh, what's up, Willie? Um, what's up? That's one a YouTube friend of mine. Um, so how it actually looks like is the stations aspect. And if you're interested, like literally go Google classroom stations and you'll get an idea of how you can model it. Most of it is going to be, uh, set up for like the, the elementary school, like the very young kids, but I do it in junior high all the time. Um, one, because it gets, it, it does build that social network aspect where the kids are like, they're, they're really bene I There's a dog here. I can't, I can't <laughs> not focus. Good snortle, by the way. <laughs> Uh, 
All right. Okay. If you're, if you have actual tears. I'm crying. Anyway, it's stations based. Basically, group the kids up into three different groups. Five, if you, five, if you actually have an aide or something like that. Uh, third yeah. Host. This is Owen. Yeah, there's a third host of Pedagogy yeah. Hypothesis. He's uh, not really helpful. But... <laughs> Doesn't have a lot to say. Yeah. It's really rough. Oh my god. Dumb. This is dumb. <laughs> Anyway, so yeah. I think Owen left after that joke. Yeah, I was like, I'm sick of your stuff. Uh, so anyway, yeah, to break them up into groups, give them at least a, a, some kind of structure with their skills. Say, hey, today you're working on this, you're working on this, you're working on this. Rotate them based on how much time you have. I have 80 minute periods, so I make my, my blocks 25 minutes long. 20 minutes usually is what it ends up being, so they can have a little bit of a break between each session, and they're not just like stabbing each other with pencils all the time. Um, I was not a fan of puns, apparently. <laughs> no, it's okay. That's he's, okay. Like, he's like, oh, more of this bullshit. Yeah. I like how you become more comfortable with swearing on this. The first, remember the first time you swore, you were just like, oh, no. Oh, no. I, I, did a, a swear I did a swear. I did a swear. Yeah. And I'm like, I don't swear. So that's how we differentiate instruction. It'll look different based on, on what whatever you teach. But think about the skills that they need to work on. Don't think of it as ability levels. Correct. So the last question that we got from our little question boxes is, how do you fit the widest array of techniques into teaching a specific subject? And this is from Cheryl at yep. Animedia Science. We love you, by the way. You're fantastic, and welcome to the Sci community. Um, okay, so how do you how do you fit all? Where is that? The from? widest array of techniques into teaching a specific subject. Okay, so what I thought of when when Cheryl asked this question was, um, it doesn't have to be on the same day. Oh, hey, Alex. Yeah, um, you're just with us. What a gem. Um, so I think of it like. You might be tempted within a 60 minute class or whatever, however long your lab lasts or whatever, to jam all of these different, I need a visual and an auditory and a kinesthetic, like I need all of these things in one session. But you only have the ability to deliver like maybe one to three good lessons per time block. Plus, if you do a ton all at the same time, nothing is gonna work. I feel like if you just jam too much, it's not, nothing's gonna land. I learned that lesson the hard way in my pedagogy practices. How so? Um, it is not, as a teacher, it's not your job to try and cram every progressive pedagogical practice into a teaching scenario. It is your job to oh, find yeah. the one that fits most appropriately into your scenario. Yeah. If you've learned a lot of cool stuff on this, that's fantastic, but please don't try and cram it all into one, one classroom because you're going to overwhelm your students. Oh gosh. I feel like that's just life advice in general. Like yeah, good point, if yeah. you make, if you make something cool, like if you make the dopest, like video or something you're going to be tempted to like put all of the cool techniques into this and then at that point you've lost the point of your story um you're just you're new and shiny and fascinated with that so the best way to fit the widest array of techniques into a specific subject i think is to understand that techniques are more of how we approach a problem so um active engagement can be a technique um scaffolding can be a technique um, differentiated instruction can be a technique, but you need to actually figure out which one is most su 